Very good day to all of you attending today. And uh, thank you very much for joining this ICC Singapore Business Federation webinar. Uh, my name is Vivek. I am a partner at Allen & Gledel in Singapore. And uh, I focus primarily on dispute resolution and international arbitration. We are here today at this webinar to talk about two broad strands or topics. Uh, one is to talk you through the various kinds of dispute resolution options that exist in Singapore today. Uh, what those options present in terms of choices to all of you as businesses and why you might select one over another for various reasons. The second strand or topic that we will talk to you today about uh, is of course the pandemic situation that we are all living in how that has uh, impacted us, and in particular, how it has impacted the legal industry and given rise to a large number of legal issues that all of us have no doubt been dealing with in our various capacities. Now, uh, to discuss these topics with you and these issues with you, we have, of course, a stellar panel with us today. Uh, I will be your moderator. And the profiles of our speakers today are, of course, in the flyer that is available to you. But to very briefly introduce them, uh, first, of course, we have Mr. Francis Xavier, who is a senior counsel and a partner at Rajantan in Singapore. Uh, Mr. Xavier is, of course, the regional head of disputes at RT, and uh, he's a veteran of over three decades in the dispute resolution space in Singapore, uh, both in the Singapore courts and in international arbitration. Uh, next, we have Ms. Uh, Chen Zingping, who is the APAC litigation and disputes management team head at Accenture in Singapore. Uh, Xinping manages and oversees a wide range of uh, commercial disputes and as well as uh, compliance related issues and investigations for Accenture in Singapore and the region. Uh, prior to joining Accenture, Xinping was a partner at a big law uh, for law firm in Singapore and was also, uh, of course, in the dispute resolution space. Uh, third, we have Ms. Hazel Tang with us. Hazel is the counsel in charge of the case management team at the International Chamber of Commerce, that is the ICC's Singapore office. Hazel essentially manages and administers all of the cases that the ICC administers in their Singapore office. Uh, before her stint at ICC, Hazel was the center director of the Singapore International Mediation Center, uh, and she's also an accredited arbitrator and an accredited mediator, uh, both in Singapore and in Shanghai. And before that, of course, Hazel was also a partner at a big four law firm in Singapore in the dispute space. Now, last but not the least, we have Ms. Margaret Joan Lee, uh, who is, of course, my colleague and also a partner at Allen & Gladden. Uh, Margaret has uh, extensive experience, again, with disputes in Singapore, uh, both in the Singapore courts and with international arbitration. Uh, and most notably, in recent times, uh, Margaret has had a substantial amount of experience, uh, including at one of the largest commercial disputes that has ever been heard in Singapore at the Singapore International Commercial Court. With that brief introduction, perhaps we can dive straight uh, into the topics that we have at hand today. Uh, and the format that we will follow for today's session uh, is for me to raise certain topics or issues uh, for the members of the panel to discuss. Of course, we would very much welcome any questions from any of the members of the audience at any point of time during the session, uh, or if you'd like to keep them uh, to the end of the session, we will, of course, devote some time for questions from uh, the audience. Uh, we do have some questions that were submitted uh, before the session from the members of the audience, and thank you so much for that. Uh, and we hope that we can address those issues and questions as part of the session. So perhaps just to just to kick things off with a more general question uh, to all of the panel members, it has been a year and a half since we've been in the COVID-19 era as it were. Uh, how has this time been for you? Uh, what are the kind of challenges you've had to face? And uh, perhaps I can start with uh, Zinping first, uh, if that's okay to kickstart the discussion and give us your thoughts. Perfect. Thank you, Vivek. Um, and hi, everyone. Well, I think I've gained a lot of perspective in the past year and a half um, that, you know, in Singapore, we are really 
luckier than most. And that's something that I'm very grateful for. Uh, and I think also in the past year and a half, I've done every single COVID cliche that everyone can think of, right? <clears throat> From baking banana bread to sourdoughs, doing Zoom cocktails, walks along the real corridor and all that. I'm all, I've done all of that. <laughs> and I, I, I can't wait until we can get to a point where, you know, we just are ready to live with COVID, but get on with life. Yeah, of course. Of course. Hazel, uh, your thoughts? Thank you, Vivek. And it has been never before, uh, we, we've never actually expected that this is going to be, there's going to be a time when we can all work from home for so long. It used to be a dream and now it's becoming a bit of a nightmare, I must say. Last year was an interesting year because we did see a bit of a slow start when the pandemic situation was still a bit uncertain. I think parties were still thinking of whether they can postpone commencing an arbitration until this is over. But then towards the later part of the first quarter, I think they realized that this is not going to end anytime soon. So we saw a very quick pick up in cases. And then we had another record year of newly registered cases last year. But uh, it has been an interesting one year. All our court sessions have been moved online now. And that's something that, that has been uh, a learning experience. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think we, we all have to kind of get on with it. And, and uh, I mean, in doing so, I suppose all of us have had to adapt to working differently in, in this in this period. Um, and, and just like to hear from all of you on how you feel uh, each of the organizations that you represent or the general legal industry has had to adapt. And, and again, perhaps I can start with you, particularly given the kind of multinational business uh, that you work with. Uh, I'm sure you have many points of contact with different uh, stakeholders, uh, how have you adapted to working in this pandemic era? Well, actually, luckily for me, from my company's perspective, because we are a technology consulting company, um, in many ways, we are ahead of the curve um, in dealing with the challenges from COVID. For example, many of our people, myself included, um, I worked from home most of the time, even before COVID became a word, you know, in our dictionaries. Um, but I guess from the business perspective, uh, our clients now recognize uh, more than ever, I think, the need to make investments in their technology and to future-proof their workforce. Because it, it is a near certainty, right, that there will be uh, disruptions to the world and, and the workplace. And I think everyone recognizes that going back to the way things worked maybe 18 months ago is, is no longer an option. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And and uh, particularly, uh, Margaret, uh, I'd be curious to hear, you know, your experience uh, in the litigation sphere. You know, have the Singapore courts been equal to the task in terms of adapting? Uh, how has it been for you in terms of running cases before the courts or in arbitration for that matter? So there's been a dramatic increase in the use of uh, technology. We had a matter before the Singapore International Commercial Court with international judges and witnesses were overseas. So it, it was really, um, we had to make certain adjustments, for instance, in the hearing time, since the judges couldn't fly in, and, as, and the witnesses were also in diff, uh, jurisdictions with different timings. And there was also the issue of how do we make sure everyone is on the same page during the proceedings and referring to the same document. So we had to make use of technology, for instance, pulling up the document uh, on screen share via Zoom. So it's, but it hasn't been an issue, it's been very smooth. And um, I foresee the greater use of technology in the future, for sure. Right. And I also understand that the Singapore courts themselves, even for uh, regular hearings, are using uh, video conferencing uh, and, of course, other forms of technology uh, quite regularly now. Yeah, that's right. Even is, for, is, that, uh, is that so, Margaret? Yeah. yeah. yeah that, that's right. Even for case management conferences where, um, you know, the court is dealing with procedural timelines, we are having this um, dealt with by way of Zoom as well. Right, right. And, and Hazel, in terms of the ICC and the arbitral institutions, uh, again, I assume that, that that would be the case with the arbitral institutions as well. And we've had some experience with some of it, but I'm sure you see it uh, much more closely in terms of what you've had to do to adapt. Certainly. I mean, I echo everything that's been shared externally among the users, the arbitration users. We have seen the parties use uh, technology in a greater manner in terms of everything from document sharing between councils 
to the actual conduct of the hearing via virtual platform. Um, one of the difficulties, of course, is trying to manage the different time zones when your witnesses and your judges or your arbitrators are in different time zones. We have seen shorter hearing days uh, spread across a longer period now that you don't have to travel. That seems to be the trend for virtual hearing when you have different time zones involved. Internally, of course, uh, we have moved our entire operations online. But even before this, actually, the secretary primarily communicates by email, and we already have a document sharing system. So that has not disrupted our work in any way. But we have come to terms with of the we have come to terms with the fact that uh, technology is going to be greater relied on, both internally and externally. So we are pushing out a new document sharing platform that is secure for our users to use. And I think you'll be seeing an announcement in this regard coming up shortly. Right. Uh, no, I think that's uh, all excellent. And again, speaking from personal experience with some of the arbitrations in recent times, uh, <clears throat> the use of technology has made things uh, extremely efficient, uh, I would say. And, and on that, I wanted to ask you, Francis, um, of course, there's been a need to embrace technology in the past year and a half. Uh, it has kind of been forced upon us, perhaps faster than many people were even prepared uh, to embrace that. But do you see that the legal sector in Singapore, whether it's law firms or other stakeholders, uh, have happily done so? Do you think it's here to stay? Or do you think there's some kind of nostalgia for the past where the moment things become okay, we're all going to go back to how we used to do things previously? Well, I think Vivek, uh, going back to the good old times, I think that's out of the question. I think the pandemic, the impact of the pandemic, you know, it looks like it's going to be with us for another year or so. So given the, the, the spread of the pandemic, it's been with us, it would have been with us if it's here for another year for about two and a half years. It's changed mindsets. And I think uh, we've all discovered that technology is actually more effective than we gave it credit for previously. And I think, um, I think all of us would agree that it's not going to be business as usual, even when the pandemic lifts. I think we recognize that for complex cases, a physical hearing, uh, especially when there's extensive cross-examination and hot tubbing of multiple experts, a face-to-face -face hearing is still preferable. Uh, even in the lead up of a case, uh, I found that, it, you know, and I'm sure, you know, Margaret and the others would agree, Hazel would agree that when you have complex case preparation, uh, the, the limits with which you can brainstorm is to some extent circumscribed by technology. You know, you can have one voice, you cannot have an overlay, you cannot have two people uh, talking at the same time. So that kind of, uh, and, and just the, the, the interacting on a screen kind of robs you of the magic of brainstorming, you know, in a team, right, when you have a complex case. But short of those circumstances, I think, you know, case management conferences, I think flying to, you know, New York or London for a case management conference, that's going to be a thing that is going to disappear with the dinosaurs. Uh, but certainly, I think there are, it, it, the physical hearings, by and large, in complex cases, I think will go back to some semblance, if not a hybrid form, some semblance of a hybrid or a pure physical hearing. Right. No, thank you. And and uh, just to just to add to what has been said, uh, I just wanted to say that at least in Singapore, with the kind of facilities that Maxwell Chambers has been able to offer, uh, whether it's a full virtual platform or a hybrid kind of uh, hearing with some part of it being physical while the other part being virtual uh, has all has all been new ideas that have come up in the past year and a half and i think uh, all excellent ideas for businesses to consider for lawyers to consider uh, to improve the efficiency of the process uh, and i think i think it's great that you know singapore has these options available today and again speaking of which in terms of the options available in singapore uh, i wanted to talk about uh, dispute resolution options. And this is, again, I'm sure something that all of you in terms of uh, entering into contracts with businesses, whether locally or internationally, uh, do have to consider. Uh, and if you don't, perhaps you should consider them a little more carefully. Uh, currently in Singapore, at least, you have four options at the very least, if not more. Uh, first, of course, you have the general litigation option before the Singapore courts. Uh, second, you have 
the arbitration option. And you have uh, first eight institutions in Singapore, uh, including, of course, the ICC, which has over the years found its Singapore office to be amongst the most successful and the most busy offices of all of its case management offices. Uh, third, you have mediation. Uh, you have the Singapore International Mediation Center in Singapore, and mediation is definitely uh, a buzzword in recent times, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. And uh, fourth now in Singapore, you have the Singapore International Commercial Court, which is a specialized court that has been set up to deal with commercial disputes and primarily international commercial disputes uh, with international judges and so on uh, to provide a different option to the normal litigation group. So uh, I wanted to get, of course, the views of our panelists on, on how does one navigate this world of options? Uh, where do we even begin when you are looking at a contract? Which one is the best of them all? There's a lot said about each one of them. And again, perhaps I can start with you, same thing. Uh, in terms of the contracts that you see as part of your business, how do you go about making this evaluation? What are the factors you consider? Yeah, happy to do that, um, I, I And I think I must say that, you know, when it comes to Singapore, actually, um, I think we're very lucky. Uh, all of the options we have available are all highly regarded. Um, our institutions and our systems are well-respected and world-class. So really, um, the choice comes down to what factors um, the business piece is more important. And for us, it's things like um, confidentiality of proceedings, right? Um, another very important factor for us is the ability to maybe salvage or preserve relations uh, despite a dispute. Uh, to a lesser extent, probably, because in Singapore, our judiciary is very fast, speed and cost is also a factor. But I think um, in terms of uh, importance, it, it does rank behind confidentiality and and uh, um, relationship preservation for us. Right, and and given given the primacy of confidentiality, uh, is arbitration, say for instance, your first port of call, uh, or would it work slightly differently in some situations? Um, so arbitration would be our preference, but. Um, because you know we have full confidence in the Singapore courts, if the client requests for matters to be litigated, we wouldn't have objections to that. Um, we right. do try to build in, right. regardless of whether it's arbitration or litigation, a mediation option as well, um, to, to attempt mediation before proceeding to a, a litigation or arbitration. Uh, we do try to build that in into our contracts as well. Right. Uh, Hazel, perhaps I can I can get your thoughts on that. I mean, uh, one, of course, from the ICC's perspective on an issue like this. And second, of course, given your experience with the Mediation Center and the uh, Singapore Convention on Mediation, which is a new creature uh, that was only signed about, about uh, two years back. Uh, what are your thoughts on particularly mediation and how you see that developing? Uh, is Singapore in a place where uh, mediation is entrenched enough deeply for businesses to seriously consider that as the first option for dispute resolution? I think fast and efficient resolution of disputes has always been our motivating factor when it comes to refining our rules or refining our processes. And as the recent Queen Mary survey has, has showed, users do prioritize hybrid solutions that can best achieve a fast, efficient and cost efficient process. And I think that it's no surprise that the ICC rules, the way that it was made and the way that it came about has always been in conjunction with the mediation rules in the same booklet. And right. ICC actually offers both mediation and arbitration services under the institution. Uh, Singapore certainly is well placed to do both. I think with the Singapore Convention, it has cemented mediation as a viable option, no longer as an alternative. I do think that now parties do consider mediation more actively when it comes to resolving disputes, whether it is after the arbitration has started. We have seen parties agree to suspend the arbitration proceedings in order to go for mediation midway, or even before arbitration starts. They come to us after a time of mediation, and then they start the arbitration process. And I think that seems to be the way to go, especially during this time when costs and whether there are still assets for you to enforce against at the end of the day, 
is a very relevant consideration for the parties. Right. Thanks. Thanks, Hazel. Uh, Francis, what are your views and how how do you advise a client who, who asks you this question or perhaps somebody in your corporate department if they ask you to weigh in on, on which option is the best today? Well, I think Vivek, you know, has, has, has been echoed. It would be horses for horses. I think uh, if confidentiality, as you rightly uh, put a key finger on the pulse of, is the key, then obviously the solution is arbitration. But I think, um, you know, some part of the market wants a precedent. They want recourse to an appeal, right? Especially if you are you know, faced with a vet, the company kind of litigation, right? They, they do want to have that recourse to, to an appeal. Uh, and sometimes they want uh, a public hearing because they want to set a precedent. You know, maybe there is a, their standard form contract and they want to make it clear to their suppliers that this has to be construed in a certain way. So they want uh, the precedent setting and obviously then they will go to court. But, you know, as uh, Simping has highlighted, um, generally we know that most disputes today go to arbitration because of the various advantages of arbitration. Uh, but yes, so I would say the front runners for the complex disputes would be SICC or even the regular courts and arbitration. And um, it very much depends on the preference of, you know, the, the, the parties in question, you know. It's a, it's a difficult choice, of course. I, I, I did note that you left mediation kind of a distant last one. Do I take it that you are not a big fan of mediation or do you have some reservations? Well, thank you for pointing that out. I, and I think, you know, um, <laughs> mediation is now become a superstar, right? So I think people are recognizing that this virus is a common enemy. And so it's better to discuss, negotiate, compromise, you know, by way of mediation. And so we've seen a huge, I mean, SIMC, SMC has seen a huge rise in numbers. And I think, and I think that's the way to go for businesses, right? Um, because, uh, so we've seen a huge rise in mediation and hybrid forms of met up, up met. Yeah, no, thank you. I, I personally, of course, uh, I'm a big fan of the hybrid process. I think where either you have an up met up where you commence an arbitration you are required to go off to do mediation and if it fails, come back or at least have a mediation before an arbitration. Uh, I think those have proved to be very cost effective. Uh, but Margaret, can I, can I get your thoughts particularly on the SICC, which uh, I think is, is uh, uh, although not that new anymore, given that it's about five years old, but still perhaps a new creature for a lot of the audience. Uh, in, and could you perhaps share your views, given your experience on what are the outstanding features of the SIC, the SICC that, may, that might make it more attractive for businesses to consider? Okay, I think I'll touch first upon um, confidentiality. So if a sure. case is an offshore case, you know, where it has no substantial connection with Singapore, you know, it's open to the court uh, to make a confidentiality order. So that's one thing to bear in mind. But um, one downside or one difference between you know litigation or proceedings before the SICC and arbitration is the enforceability issue so you know for arbitration awards they can be enforced in 100 over countries that are signatories to the New York convention whereas for you know court judgments it depends on uh, reciprocal arrangements between Singapore and other jurisdictions although I know that I, th I think there are various memorandums of understanding that have been entered into between the SICC and uh, these other courts as well um, in terms of um, the, the differences or the unique features of the SICC, well, you have uh, foreign judges involved. So if you have a matter that um, hinges a lot on a foreign law matter, it's good uh, to have a judge from that background. And um, you can even have uh, foreign lawyers making submissions on uh, foreign law as opposed to you know, getting an expert witness on foreign law to give evidence. So these are some uh, unique features of the SICC. And you know, based on the proceedings that I'm involved in, they, they tend to happen uh, very quick. Uh, the timelines move very fast, which is uh, a bit pressurizing, but, you know, I think it's good for um, businesses and clients when they're thinking about, you know, having this uh, matter quickly resolved and written off their books. Right. And, and in terms of uh, how you would advise your clients, would it be a fundamental difference, perhaps, whether the contract is a purely domestic contract, say, between two Singapore businesses, as opposed to an international cross-border contract, say, with a party in 
India or China or you know uh, Europe for that matter? Um, definitely, um, if it's a more you know if it involves international law elements, I would suggest you know let's say arbitration or the SICC, and I think it also depends you know on the complexity um, of the matter as well. If it's just a simple debt, uh, uh, you know. Uh, claim for a debt, you might just go to the courts and have it resolved quickly. But yet, um, you know, um, various arbitration rules also have expedited procedures. So it's really a, a whole mix of uh, factors to consider. Yeah, yeah, and of course, I think uh, what the underlying factor always is uh, for a business that is based uh, in Singapore, you do not want to be in the courts of an unfamiliar jurisdiction uh, because that's that's recipe for disaster. So uh, in, in, the, in the situation where you are not able to get a counterparty to agree to the Singapore courts, then arbitration or the SICC may be uh, kind of other wire medias to get a counterparty to, to agree to still having your dispute resolved in Singapore, but in, in, in perhaps uh, not in the local forums where a counterparty might feel intimidated. Absolutely but, right. Uh, moving, yeah, and, uh, perhaps I can just get your thoughts, Francis, on whether you believe uh, COVID has any impact at all on this on this choice? Well, what has happened is, uh, you know, as some of uh, the panelists have remarked, COVID has given rise to a huge uptick in disputes, right? So not all, of, many of them have led up, uh, landed in arbitration or in, in, in the courts as Hazel has uh, recorded the, the rise in, in, in numbers. But I think what COVID has done is created a superstar in mediation, you know, because that's what we've seen. We've seen that businesses recognize that, you know, in these difficult times, it doesn't suit, you know. Um, and, and I think businesses, you know, uh, echoing what Xinping said, relationships are important, you know, your, 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 your business partners, you know, both of you are suffering. There's a common enemy. It doesn't make sense to, to you know, try and battle each other in the courts or even in arbitration at this time you know, when uh, the flow of goods, people, money is severely restricted, you know. And I, we've seen, you know, what's been heartening is that businesses, we've actually seen people being more willing to discuss, to talk, uh, to, to come to a compromise. And so that's been heartening. So the big winner, I think, in this pandemic ravaged times, uh, Vivek, has been mediation. There's been a huge uptick in formal, formal mediation. So, so that's been the true effect of, of the pandemic. No, that's that's very interesting, and uh, I think uh, turning again, the economic impact of the pandemic has obviously been enormous, and and I think uh, uh, businesses across the world, especially in Singapore, uh, have had to face various various kinds of issues, and that actually brings me to the next broader topic that I did want to get your views on uh, is the economic impact, of course, manifests itself as we all know in the form of legal issues, you know, contractual issues that inevitably uh, people are facing today. And I think a lot of the businesses uh, who are attending today uh, have also perhaps faced similar issues, simple issues such as delays in payments, uh, manpower shortage, claims from you know somebody above you, it's a main contractor or a subcontractor, as the case may be. Uh, same thing, how, how, how have you dealt with these kinds of issues as a business? What is your approach? Well, First, I'm very glad to say we haven't contributed to the huge uptick in cases that Francis was talking about. <laughs> um, I think for us, we uh, the perspective that we take is that we recognize uh, COVID has an impact on everyone, right? Our partners, our clients, our, our own employees as well. And our approach has been that as far as possible, we try and work with our clients we, to address the COVID challenges collaboratively and together rather than resorting to strict legal terms. Uh, I, and I'm actually very glad to say that the vast majority of our clients have been receptive to this approach. They've worked with us um, in these trying times. Um, and together, we find a solution to the problem. Right. So for example, a part of our business um, is in business process operations, uh, outsourcing type of work. And um, these typically require that our teams are on site, whether at the client's office or our own office. But you know, with the movement controls and, and the lockdowns that we've seen all over the world, right? Um, there have been restrictions that prevent our team members from being physically present in the office. And you know, rather than 
trying to say the contract is frustrated or there is force majeure, you know, we've worked with the clients to enable these people to uh, our people to work from home um, while putting in the necessary security protections, right? So this allows us to continue providing services to our clients. Um, it enables our clients' operations to go on with minimal disruptions. And at the same time, we can still give our clients the assurance and the peace of mind that their security of their information is not compromised. And you know, and that's a change to the contract terms, but that has worked out that and that will work out if you know everybody can work together to try and get to that solution. Right. Right. And and I mean everybody's in the same boat, I suppose, uh, globally. Of course, there's minor variations depending on which country you are. So I can I can see the merit to that. But but uh, uh, turning to you, Francis, and, and we do understand you are one of the lawyers who is involved in some of the leading cases in Singapore on force measure. Um, if things do go south, um, what is the position in Singapore when it comes to making claims uh, on the basis of force measure? Uh, what, is, what is your advice to businesses in terms of the rights that they do have, provided, of course, their contracts provide for it? I mean, so, so Vivek, like, uh, you know, colleagues in your firm and my firm, we've seen a huge number of people coming to us to say, you know, we've been hit by this pandemic. Uh, there's a huge body blow. Can we rely on a force majeure clause or would the doctrine of frustration apply? And, um, you know, you know the, the, the answer legally from a legal point of view is very simple. Force majeure really depends on the way the force majeure clause is a contractual clause. So it very much depends on the specific wording of the clause in your contract. So we've, you know, so during these pandemic times, we know for a fact that force majeure clauses have succeeded in India, uh, New Delhi, several cases have come on uh, and they've succeeded. And you also have a recent Saudi Arabian decision on force majeure where COVID has been uh, said to be a force majeure event, succeeded. Now, um, so, but that really depends on the terms of the clause, right? In terms of the doctrine of frustration, it's very difficult. And I know it has failed in the UK courts. There were several attempts to say COVID amounts to frustration that has failed in the UK courts. We haven't seen a case yet. I'm not aware of a case where COVID has been successfully argued, argued to be a frustrating event. In the common law world, I haven't seen it. Um, maybe there's something that we missed it, but I haven't seen it. And it's no surprise that it would be difficult because frustration essentially you need to establish unforeseeability, you couldn't have foreseen the, the pandemic. So if you have any contracts beyond this, entered into contracts beyond the start of the pandemic, uh, you know, after it broke out in Wuhan, it'd be very hard to say it was unforeseeable. Um, and more importantly, you have to show impossibility of performance. And a lot of the lockdowns, you know, like even the current measures that we're having in Singapore, it's not permanent, it's temporary. So if you want to go down the route of arguing that it's force majeure or frustration, you're going to have an uphill legal battle, right? Because the court really, uh, so, so I think the solution, uh, you know, and very much, you know, listening to Sinping, it makes sense for businesses to negotiate and compromise rather than do a headbutt in these difficult times under the banner of force majeure of frustration, because it would be an uphill task, you know? Back to you, Billy. Right. Um Hazel, what's your experience been with, with issues like this, disputes arising out of COVID? Uh, the general perception, of course, and I think as we've heard from Francis and Zinping, is that the issues are numerous, but are they actually resulting in people filing arbitrations? Has the ICC seen upturn of these kind of cases? Or is it that the issues are there, but they don't actually result in disputes? Well, we've certainly seen uh, uptick in cases of affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. And there are two main fronts on which they are impacted. The first is the, the nature of the suit itself arose because of the pandemic, whether it's because the contract was not able to be performed or the parties just is not willing to perform the contract in light of the pandemic um, situation. I think a lot of disputes have come to us because of the pandemic. And certainly issues of frustration and force major are common defenses that we see. Uh, the parties try to rely on. The second impact that I see is on the process itself. 
uh, whether in terms of the party trying to start the arbitration, the dispute resolution process, um, the pandemic affects different jurisdictions different ways. And some of them are still facing lockdowns now, where basic infrastructure like going to the bank or getting the company employees to get the payment processes going, there has been a lot of difficulty even on that basic level. So because of the pandemic, we've been seeing a lot of uh, increasing more requests for more time to make payments or requests for payments to be made in installments in order to get the arbitration process going itself, even though the nature of the dispute has nothing to do with the pandemic. So it, it has certainly impacted the way that the arbitration process has, has been going on in the past year. No, absolutely. I also personally do echo that because I think uh, it has impacted uh, even how lawyers have been able to uh, interact with clients, obtain instructions, uh, sometimes even access to documents has been difficult uh, in some cases, uh, which has, I think, led to extensions of times in the process and so on. Uh, but but moving, moving back to the issues in terms of uh, the businesses themselves, Margaret, uh, what would be your advice to our audience today uh, in terms of the more on the ground issues that they're facing? Uh, and would you say that uh, the pandemic has had such a overall impact that uh, actually going into formal dispute resolution processes uh, may be avoided, better avoided actually, uh, given given the kind of uh, impact that the pandemic has had. Yeah, I, I completely agree that, you know, uh, you know, litigation, you know, contentious proceedings really benefit, do not benefit businesses except lawyers. So in the course of last year and this year, you know, we've given advices relating to uh, force majeure, for instance, when there was the dormitories issue, there was a shortage of manpower and, you know, certain businesses couldn't complete their contracts. So that was an issue that we had advised on. But ultimately, you know, whether the force majeure provision applies, it's a factually intensive inquiry. And, you know, sometimes it's an interpretation of the facts and how lawyers play out the facts. So again, I, I echo what everyone says, you know, it's the best to avoid disputes and try to resolve the matter amicably if possible. And in terms of practical steps, if there really is a dispute, you know, I think documentation is important. So for instance, um, and looking at your force majeure clause is important as well. So if it's, for instance, does your clause say that um, performance is prevented or does it say that it's um, hindered or delayed, which connotes a lower level of a hindrance or obstruction to what you can do? And some of the force majeure provisions might also um, require you to take reasonable steps to mitigate um, your loss. So it's important to look at what the provision provides and important to document um, what are the events that you say has stopped you from performing your contract and the steps you've taken to try to mitigate uh, those effects. Right, right. And, and Margaret, what's your view uh, on, say, some of the measures in Singapore? For instance, you know, you've had the COVID Temporary Measures Act uh, that, that came into force last year with a whole host of measures. I think you yourself and I have sat as assessors uh, under that act uh, in relation to certain claims. What is, how do you think something like that has helped businesses? Uh, is it something that businesses should be very aware of, should take seriously and consider in terms of uh, one of the options to resolve the kind of issues that they might be facing? Um, so there's the assessors um, scheme that you have mentioned, and I think there's also mediation, if, if I recall correctly, um, the, there has been a lowering of the fees that you need to pay for mediation at the SIMC or, or the uh, mediation centre, I can't recall offhand, but I know that the government has taken various steps to try to make it easier for businesses to try to uh, resolve their disputes. Right, right. Well, so, so what I seem to be hearing is the best approach, uh, and I think uh, Zinping <coughs> can we did the best is in this kind of situation everybody's in the same boat and the best way is to try and sit down with a counterparty to try and resolve it rather than rather than commence an expensive litigation which would be difficult uh, both from a legal and a management perspective uh, and in that in that uh, related to that i think one of the issues that i've certainly seen uh, as a result of covid uh, and maybe even before that is the need for dealing with a counterparty who may, despite you know all of this, uh, take actions and steps uh, which may not be you know conducive to continuing a relationship, whether it's terminating a contract overnight, not making payments, uh, you know disposing of assets, uh, things like that. 
And, and in relation to these kinds of actions, of course, there are various ways in which uh, parties can seek relief, both in arbitration and before the Singapore courts. So I just wanted to dwell on that for a few minutes and, and get uh, all of your thoughts and you know how, how helpful that is and what those options really are. And perhaps I can request you, Hazel, uh, to, to start this, particularly given the special procedures with the emergency arbitrator that the ICC has, uh, which have uh, seemed so popular. Uh, we've all had our experiences with them and uh, we do find them very, very efficient. So perhaps you can talk to us about that and how that's developed at the ICC. Thank you. The emergency arbitrator provisions have certainly been used by the parties quite often under the ICC rules. In fact, recently in the 2021 rules, we, we increased the cap on uh, emergency uh, expedited procedure provision from 2 million to 2.5 million so that the arbitration process itself can be conducted in a shorter, quicker manner. But in, 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 six, in six months, I believe, right? Uh, yeah. About six for, months, yeah. For EPP, six months. And yeah. generally, we have seen EPP processes con, con, commenced and completed within six months. Uh, but even before starting an arbitration, parties have the option to ask for emergency arbitrator relief, which is what you mentioned. Uh, this is before the, the tribunal is even constituted, and usually for urgent relief that cannot wait. For example, if a performance bond has been called, or if there is risk of dissipation of assets. Um, normally, if there is an arbitration clause in the contract, parties can come to ICC, and we will appoint the arbitrator within one to two days. The, uh, the emergency arbitrator will then give an order, which is binding on the parties, uh, within 15 days from him getting the file. So we are looking at a process that's usually completed within um, 15 to 20 days from when we get it to when the order is actually granted. And usually even before the actual order is given, parties may also ask for interim relief in the emergency arbitrator proceeding so that parties maintain status quo and don't dissipate the assets even before the order is, is given. So there are a lot of options for parties facing difficult situations, time sensitive situations uh, caused by the current pandemic. The EPP process, of course, is another popular option, especially for quantum uh, in dispute, which is lower than, than what is usually encountered. Because the EPP process itself is a cheaper process and a faster process. So usually that's what parties go for if their contract satisfies the conditions and the amount is lower. Thanks, thank you. And, and again, I, I did want to emphasize that having personally used the EA process uh, at the ICC, I, I can say that it is extremely efficient, it is extremely quick and very, very effective. Uh, Francis, Margaret, uh, I wanted to get your thoughts on this particular issue uh, and how you contrast that with the Singapore courts in particular. Well, Vivek, you know, I think um, if, if, you know, in Singapore, if you're before leading, uh, you know, arbitral institution like the ICC, um, you know, you get seamless um, access to interim urgent relief, right? Um, and paradoxically, uh, the pandemic has made it easier to get this relief faster because now everything is online, right? So you don't, because now, you know, we are, we are now away from the fixation with physical hearings, um, so it's actually much faster, you know, like you, I mean, so the court, the SICC, for instance, has released uh, video con, um, you know, protocols, and, and that is equally available with leading arbitral institutions like the ICC. So really, in terms of seeking interim urgent relief in the days of the pandemic, uh, with the virtual platforms, it's, it's actually faster. So uh, it's very, very seamless. And, and you're quite right, the emergency arbitral mechanism protocols have really made it uh, very accessible, even in arbitration. So you, you don't really see a difference, you know, between uh, the court uh, recourse and arbitration, except in the rare cases where you need to go and have a bank injuncted, you know, you need to have, you need to injunct a third party. So, so even then, if there is a contract, what we would do, uh, and I'm sure, you know, uh, and ANG, ANG, the leading colleagues would do the same, would be to get an arbitral uh, injunction and then uh, go to the court and say, you know, we've got an uh, injunction is between the parties. Now we need to widen it 
you know, uh, to to kind of get the, the the peripheral parties to also be enjoined in this injunction. And I think that has worked very well. And I'm sure Margaret's uh, experience would probably be the same. Margaret? Yeah, I don't, I don't have much to, to add to that, except, yes, you know, where there are third parties involved, you probably need to go to the court because arbitration is a consensual process. But nonetheless, you know, with technology and everything and the way the world has moved and developed, whether it's arbitration or litigation, in terms of how quick you can get relief, it, it, it's good for businesses and it's effective and efficient. Yeah, and, and just to add to that, I think uh, particularly where where the EA process, the emergency arbitrator process in arbitration, uh, if you have an arbitration agreement can be very effective. Again, as if you're dealing with parties in the cross-border context, because now emergency arbitrator orders and awards made in Singapore uh, have in fact shown to be enforceable uh, by law in some jurisdictions and in some jurisdictions, even where there is no supporting legislation for such enforcement, say, for example, in India, they have been enforced by the local courts against counterparties there. Uh, so it can be it can be a very effective tool if you are dealing with a foreign party uh, and, you know, there is some emergent action that you want to prevent. You can still you can still have that issue determined in Singapore uh, in a very effective, efficient way. Uh, and have it enforced against the counterparty in a foreign jurisdiction. Uh, but I, I want to get some things you on this. Is, is this all uh, as relevant in a business sense? How often do you have to come across uh, having to think about making such a request or defend uh, such a request? Well, <clears throat> thankfully in my industry, not very often. <laughs> it's. Uh, I think it's more um, prevalent, I guess, in commodities or, or um, product supply type of situation. Um, not so much in the IT sector, thankfully. <laughs> but of course, it is something, um, one of the considerations, I guess, when we look at the dispute resolution clause is if we do need it, right, in the un unlikely event. Uh, but I guess it ranks as one of the um, lower considerations. Right, right. Uh, I suppose perhaps in, in your industry, one of the situations where it could transpire is if a party is is about to say breach confidentiality or, uh, you know, disclose information, it, I suppose it might come in handy in that kind of context. Yeah, that's, that's about, I think, the only context. Right, right. Uh, we have about 10 minutes left. I just wanted to pause here uh, to see if anybody from the audience who wanted to raise a question for our panel. Okay, uh, if, not, if not, perhaps we can plod on. Uh, I did want to get uh, one particular uh, answer from the audience members, uh, your views on one particular question. Uh, and perhaps I can ask you this, Francis, uh, is this the impact of the pandemic in terms of the options to go in for insolvency proceedings uh, or liquidation or winding up options. Uh, are those still uh, the same as they were before or have there been any changes which are more beneficial for businesses to consider? Well, I think Vivek, the, the answer is that, you know, there are these moratoriums. Um, so for liquidations and uh, bankruptcies, uh, the quantum uh, in question and the time frame uh, within which you can commence has, has been extended and increased. So I think the, the you know I think the businesses just need to be alive to the fact that uh, there is a moratorium now, um, and uh, so one has to be very very clear about the framework in place. I mean, if you're looking at Singapore, one of the challenges we have in cross border uh, disputes or trade is that you have uneven uh, laws across, right? So if you have a, a two counterparties, Singapore and Malaysia, Malaysia would have completely different uh, COVID measures as opposed to Singapore. That has, is proving to be a difficult challenge. Um, but insofar as you're dealing with a situation in Singapore, there are these moratorium in, in place. If you come within certain types of contracts, you can't even commence court litigation. Um, there is breathing space being afforded uh, before you can take someone into bankruptcy or winding up. So I think that's what the businesses need to be uh, aware of. And, and I think in practice, uh, and I'm sure, you know, uh, Vivek, you and your colleagues and, and Margaret uh, would share the same experience, is that fortunately, I think nobody in this time 
uh, has shown a, a, a high degree of keenness to, to make somebody a bankrupt or wind somebody up because I think there is a recognition that we are all suffering uh, because of you know a situation that has been brought upon us without our fault or choice. And so there has been uh, a, a kind of a temperance uh, to, to, to going to the winding up. But you know, of course, uh, so uh, you, you see a lot of companies being wound up, uh, not because of these sort of fights, but because I think, you know, certain industries are just going underwater uh, by, by virtue of the pandemic driven environment, you know? So I, I, I think that's right. uh, good businesses have been enlightened in their approach. Right. Uh, Margaret, any, any thoughts on that particular area? Um, no. Yeah. I, I mean, I okay. do agree uh, with you on utilizing temperance and trying to resolve the disputes for sure. Right. Uh, one, one other question I had, and again, I, I just want to leave it to open to anybody to comment on, is uh, uh, is it the case that there is a greater prevalence of uh, internet fraud, online fraud uh, in these in these COVID times? Uh, because I think we have certainly seen at the firm uh, a larger uh, number of investigations that seem to be flowing in in terms of work. Uh, I just wanted to get anybody's thoughts if, if you'd like to comment on that. Well, I could go. Um, there yes. certainly has been an increase in, in such incidents. Uh, we do, I mean, we have a cybersecurity practice um, and I hear from my colleagues in a cybersecurity practice, they are busier than ever. Um, I think it's, it's partly due to work from home because, you know, everything is via emails, everything is online. Um, and also, I think partly contributed by people letting down their guts because um, they're in, because of, you know, their additional stresses from, from the pandemic situation. Um, sometimes people become a bit more careless um, and that gives, you know, the uh, fishers or scammers that opportunity to, to get that in. Uh, so for sure, we've seen an increase in, the, in phishing scams, um, internet scams, you know, um, internet fraud cases. There's no doubt about that. And we don't think that it will go down actually. You think I just want to add that, to I think, embrace. Yeah. Yes. Right. Uh, no, I just go want ahead. to add that you, you hit a raw nerve uh, because I think now we are working off our laptops, you know, whether it's from the kitchen, the bedroom, you know, on the in the park. And so everything has gone online. And and so the risk, you know, uh, we are we are now now constantly exposed to the risk of cyber fraud, right? So you've heard the, the major cases where New York, you know, huge media, that media firm, you know, where there was a huge data breach uh, leakage. Uh, on a daily basis, you know, I think our uh, law firms and uh, private uh, companies are at risk, you know. So I think it's very important that we, we prevent data breaches. And, you know, in the dispute resolution arena, we've seen a, not a huge, but a, certainly a significant uptick in sort of people trying to gain the system, right? Witness tampering. We've seen that and it's become yeah. easier because, you know, uh, there's no physical check. Uh, but so I think it behoves all of us uh, to maintain the integrity of arbitral processes, court processes, um, you know, as arbitrators, counsel, uh, to make sure that, you know, the integrity of the system and the process is maintained. Back to you, Vivek. Yeah, no, thank, thank you, Francis. Um, before, I think, I think we should be drawing this to a close, but perhaps I can, I can ask uh, all of you in turn, uh, maybe just to share some concluding thoughts in terms of uh, what you perhaps found most challenging uh, in the last year and a half and uh, what lessons, if any, you know, would you suggest to the businesses attending today, uh, either in terms of uh, how you've had to deal with issues or advise clients uh, in dealing with issues? Uh, any concluding thoughts? Perhaps, uh, Francis, if you'd like to go first. I think I just wanted to say that, you know, every cloud has a silver lining. And I think the pandemic certainly has taught us that there's another way of doing things. I think it has given us pause to reflect, do some deep process thinking about, you know, what really matters in life. And I think beyond that, I think uh, whether we like it or not, even with or without the pandemic, the IT revolution was upon us. And I think the pandemic 
has forced us in many ways, uh, challenged us in many ways to look at our traditional ways of working, of being, of interacting with each other. And I think post the pandemic, we are going to be, in that sense, the richer for it. Thank you. Vivek. Thank you. Thank you, Francis. Uh, Zinping, your thoughts? I'm very happy to hear what Francis say, given uh, where, where you know I work. But um, I, we do think that uh, with the pandemic, sure, there are challenges, but there are also increased opportunities, right? Um, if people um, can adapt, uh, increase their adaptability, take up the challenges, um, it will... There, there are opportunities to be seeded for the future. So I guess that's the silver lining that Francis was talking about. Um, in terms of um, uh, the, <clears throat> sorry, in terms of, you know, challenges for the future, um, I think it's, it, it continues to be who can uh, pivot faster, right? Depending on whatever challenges are, uh, come ahead, um, who can adapt, who can pivot faster. And I think that, needs to be sort of front and center of everyone in the business, whether you're a lawyer, whether you're in the business, everyone working, how are you going to adapt? How are you going to make sure that you can always stay ahead of the curve? I think that's most important. Back to you, Vivek. And, and uh, Hazel, Hazel I, I suppose uh, the ICC experience is quite, is quite inspiring for all of us. So uh, any thoughts on that? Thank you. And I, I definitely echo what has already been shared. I think the ability of our organizations to pivot and adapt to the current challenges is going to be key in rising this out. I think the, the idea that the traditional way of doing things, in particular the reliance on physical documents, face-to-face -face meetings, that has to be resolved given the limitations. Just like how even ICT has to adapt our court sessions and the way that we interact to a of our virtual platform across our offices. I think going forward, um, companies do have to think about how to uh, refine and tweak their crisis management strategy. I think at the beginning of last year, a lot of companies reacted quickly and came together and continued to refine how they adapt their working processes and to make sure business can go on given the constraints. But now that we have a bit of a breather and it looks like this is going to be uh, still a long run. You have to think about the crisis management strategy, how to refine it, and one of the things that you need, especially in terms of cybersecurity. If the company has not been thinking about that, I think given the current situation, as you've pointed out, we've seen our fair share as well. It's time to rethink whether the, the cybersecurity protocols within the company is enough, in addition as part of the crisis management strategy. Thank you. Thank you, Hazel. Uh, Margaret, your concluding thoughts? Yeah, I, th I think it's made us a more resilient and stronger overall in trying to adapt to the new normal. Um, and um, But I think it does, has, it has somewhat blurred the lines between, you know, work and home, especially when you're dealing with international clients and you just have to be, you know, nearly on call 24-7. <laughs> so, but then again, it's a good challenge. It makes you stronger. It makes you better. Yeah, absolutely. I, I completely agree with that. Uh, I think thank you very much. And uh, just again, checking if anybody in the audience would like to uh, raise any question uh, or any comment on the discussion uh, before we close. Okay, uh, I think all that remains is for me to uh, thank our panel members. Thank you for taking the time to join us and uh, thank our organizers, the SPF and the ICC. Uh, and I think it's an indication of the times we are in that uh, despite everything that is happening around us, we are still able uh, to meet all of you, uh, even if it is virtually. Uh, if at all, if any of you would like to reach out to any of us, uh, the panel members, uh, you can certainly uh, request somebody at the SPF to guide you, uh, or I'm sure Google will, will show you the right path. So uh, thank you again. Have a good day, everyone. And thank you for joining us. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye.